Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University Centre uh, Public Lecture for December. My name is Jamie Morgan Green. I work at the college here. I'm the Community Hub Manager. And the University Centre opened uh, in January as a partnership with the University of Worcester. Um, and it's where we'll be putting on free lectures each month around different topics. And um, we hope the lectures will inspire you to consider higher education. Our lecture today is by Dr. Helen Watts of the University of Worcester, and it's on coronavirus and consumer behaviour. So we'll hand over to Helen shortly, but first some housekeeping for the event today. Um, hopefully as you joined, you noticed that your cameras and microphones are switched off. Please continue to be muted throughout the lecture so we don't have any background noise that could interrupt the talk. If you have any questions for Helen, we encourage you to use the chat box and we will do a short Q&A at the end. At the bottom right, you should see a purple tab with arrows. Once you click this, you will see the chat window. The chat will be monitored throughout the lecture. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Helen. Hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me. You should be able to see me as well. Is that all sounding OK? Yeah, very good. OK, um, thank you very much for having me today um, for the session. I will now just share my slides with you all so you can see what I can see. OK. Okay, so you should be able to see um, my slides. Um, I have just seen some comments in the chat about sound, not being able to hear sound. So this happened to me actually when I first joined. Um, what you might want to do is just um, log out and log back in again. Um, never fails, okay? Um, so maybe um, try logging back in and logging out. Maybe somebody could put that in the chat window. Okay, um, so without further ado, I will get going. Um, can you all um, just let me know in the chat box if, the major if most of you can hear me okay and you can see everything? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much. That's great. Okay. So, thanks very much. Thanks for all the comments, guys. That's great. Okay, so welcome to today's session. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Helen and I have a background in, um, well, I'm a senior lecturer in marketing um, at the University of Worcester. I hold a PhD in consumer psychology. Um, I'm a registered psychologist, uh, occupational, so that looks at all of the kind of um, HR, talent management, psychometric assessment type of things. Um, I also have a background in associate work, so I've worked historically for, social, um, for different consultancies on various HR related projects. Um, currently, I predominantly teach consumer behaviour, marketing, research methods at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, as well as conducting my own research and um, supervising students, um, so including so PhD students, but all other types of students as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, today's talk, then, what do I want to spend today talking to you all about? Well, first and foremost, I want today to be a little bit of a personal reflection as well as sharing some theoretical insights with you all. Um, I would like to talk to you about consumer rationality um, because for me, the idea of rationality and anxiety are inherently linked. Um, I want to talk to you about the impact of anxiety on consumer rationality. So how is it if we feel anxious, does that affect the way that we think and the way that we um, perform cognitively? Um, I'll also be sharing some information with you about the impact of coronavirus, um, well, the coronavirus pandemic on anxiety and behaviour, consumer behaviour. Um, and also what it means to be anxious about the virus itself. 
and finishing with a look to the future okay so how does the future look um past the pandemic okay if we can think that far ahead i'm sure we can okay so before we get into the nitty gritty i want to share with you and maybe some of you and i'd be really interested if you can relate to any of these um if you can um if you can relate to some of the things i experienced during my first lockdown trip out um, and this wasn't the social this was my first trip to buy non-essential goods um, now before going out this was me you know wanting to go out to the supermarket to buy things for my family things that we needed something all these things were very new and very different firstly there had to be an accurate list you know, I had to say to my husband, don't WhatsApp me with things that you want from the shop. I need a list before I go because I can't touch my phone when I'm there. And there needed to be, for me, some nostalgia. I found myself the first time in 20 years listening to music from the 80s, from the 90s. Um, I just felt a sense of nostalgia and I really needed that. It almost reminded me of, I don't know if any of you have seen Mad Max, but wanting to kind of braving the elements, like driving ferociously trying to um, feel like I was doing something really brave uh, and daring. Now, all I was doing was going to the supermarket, but I had a real strong sense of duty. During that lockdown trip, I had to think about, and I'm sure you have had to think about this too, what order do you do things in? Do you put your sanitizer on and then your gloves and then your mask, or should it be a different way around? You had to balance things like compliance and pragmatism. So for example, do you just comply with the arrows on the floor of the supermarket or do you just go pragmatically where there is clear space and sometimes that was quite difficult for me as a consumer and for everybody as a consumer to kind of to work that out and um, for me personally i was also on maternity leave so i was thinking about weaning my my baby and how to make her trans make the transition onto formula milk and to kind of you know solid foods so i had to kind of think at the same time about all these future needs i might have and the future the things i might need to buy for I had to think about what is essential you know our sticker books for my other daughter would they be classed as essential probably not um, but they were essential to me um, because i really felt that i needed to keep my four-year-old entertained during that lockdown period how many bags of pasta count as stockpiling? Does anybody know? This was very difficult for us, to, for us to decide on. Being trapped at a self scan. Again, maybe some of you can relate to this, but there's nothing more demoralizing than feeling you've spent so much time and, and effort being very socially distant walking around a supermarket. And then you get to the self scan machines and then lots of people are barging past you. They're squeezing past you, breathing all over your food. And you think, why have I, why did I go to all that effort? Afterwards, you get home feeling quite relieved, happy, but then you have to think, how do I actually get into the house? How do I touch the door handles? How do I unpack the food? So overall, my first lockdown trip reflects on this has made me think as a person and as an academic, you know, what, what was I anxious about? Why couldn't I think clearly? You know, why was that difficult? You know, did it affect my sense of rational behavior? Um, but then again, the big question is, are we ever as rational as we think we are? So more rational than chimps, apparently. Now, you know, we are supposed to be the evolved species. We're supposed to be the species that has the bigger cerebral cortex. Um, we have more capacity for reasoning and thinking and making decisions. We should be perfectly rational, OK? We have these big, you know, the, the developed skulls, the developed brain capacities. But it's not just as easy as that. You know, if we were rational consumers, if we we're truly rational, we should be able to use all the information available to us and weigh up the features, the benefits, pros, cons, um, cost benefit analysis. If we were completely rational and if we were using our um, evolved capacities to their true extent, you may have seen these as business students, you may have seen something similar. But, you know, we're supposed to be theoretically rational and able to make good decisions where we progress through these different stages, where we progress through, where we recognise we have a problem. So we go shopping, we search for information, we evaluate alternatives, we choose our product, and then we have the outcome. But we aren't always 
I'm loving the comments, by the way. That's great. You kept buying more junk foods like Chris. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody did, Tom. Um, we, you know, we're supposed to be rational progressing through these stages, but there's a lot of things already, even before the pandemic began, that stopped us from acting rationally. OK, so, you know, it's it was first kind of um, suggested by Herbert Simon that actually we're not always rational. We pick and choose as consumers when we want to be rational. We have something called bounded rationality, limits to when we are rational and when we are not rational. Also, as consumers, we like to cheat, okay? We aren't rational, we like to cheat, we like to use shortcuts, um, rules or shortcuts or known as heuristics. And these are things that we follow to try and make our decision-making as quick and easy as possible. So, um, for example, and again, please share with me some of your rules or heuristics. You may use some of these things to make your decision-making quick and easy. Whatever comes up on page one of Google will be good. If it's made in the UK, it will be better quality. The more features, the better. Handmade mm. is better. Or don't trust places that have adjectives in the title. Or this brand is always good. Now these are, as you can imagine, things that we try and adopt in every purchasing situation to give ourselves less of a headache when buying these, um, when buying products, and making decisions. So with all of these things, you kind of think, well, we're not as rational as, 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 as we are anyway. We already struggle sometimes to make the best decisions, to make optimal decisions. There's some other things that get in the way of good decision making, again, even before the pandemic even began. Um, three main heuristics that stand out um, for me and I, I always come back to is from the work of Kahneman and Tversky. Um, the three main flaws in our thinking, if you will. Um, Sometimes when we are thinking about which product to buy, which is the best decision to make, we apply um, representativeness heuristic. OK, so this is where we will make assumptions based on how something looks. OK, so if, for example, there, if it looks just like an iPhone, it must be good. OK, so sometimes we need um, existing information um, that gives us a similarity, like a benchmark that we can assess other products against. But that flaws our thinking. Another thing that flaws our thinking is the availability and bias or the availability heuristic. This is where the information that we have that is most um, salient to us that we can remember, we use that the most. I can remember seeing that phone recently, so that must be better, right? Or oh, anchoring. This is where we suggest, we, we allow a suggested price to be anchored in our minds without thinking properly about the true price or the true value. So, for example, if a product was originally £150, but now it is £145, we consider that to be cheap, just because it's cheaper than the relative anchor that we had in our minds. So, these are, and, the, and you can probably relate to some of these things. We do these things, we follow these heuristics to try and make our, our lives easier, okay? But we are not the best decision makers. Other irrational influences, confirmation bias, only paying attention to information that supports our existing view. Uniqueness bias, well, it's different for me, you know? So it, all the other things, they don't apply, it's different for me, okay? We all like to think that we are unique and we have a unique set of circumstances. Scarcity principle. Stocks are low, are low, so therefore I want it more. If something becomes scarce, it becomes more in demand. Framing, the way that things are positioned to us makes a difference. Um, so for example, loss aversion, people being much more um, driven to avoid losing money than the delight that they might feel if they were to gain money. So for example, if you were able to, um, if you, we're walking down the street and you lose 10 pounds, how would you feel? Absolutely devastated, no doubt. If you lose 10 pounds, ruins your day. It's, it's catastrophic, okay? However, if somebody gives you 10 pounds, you'd probably think, oh, that's all right, that's quite, that's quite nice. So the proportionality of receiving money, receiving reward is uh, different to 
the um, the feeling of losing something. Okay, so it's not proportionate. This is where in consumer behaviour we've seen moves towards things like show, you know, uh, trends or quite damaging trends of showrooming. So this is where people will be um, going into stores purely to try out products in order to, um, but not with any intention of buying from there. Okay, but all they're trying to do is to make sure that they, they like the product, but then they will shop elsewhere to get a good deal somewhere else because they couldn't bear the thought of losing a, a good deal. Okay, but this damages um, shops or it changes the reason people go to shops. Um, sunk cost fallacy. So again, another weird and wonderful thing that we do as consumers, I'll use it more because I've paid for it. You know, if you go to the cinema, you know, and uh, you've paid your £15 or however much it costs these days, I can't remember, a lot, I think. Um, you go to the cinema and you pay the money and you get there five minutes in, you realise that you don't really, you're not going to enjoy the film. What do you do? You sit through it because you think, well, I've paid the money. But then you end up depleted in your £15 and your two hours worth of time. OK, some cost fallacy. It, it, it um, drives a lot of bad decision making. Another um, bias, OK, that we experience and then we'll look at and we'll move on to anxiety in just a moment is simulation bias. So this is where we are very much biased towards products that we can imagine. So if we can imagine using a product, um, it will be much more likely we will purchase that product. So, you know, I can imagine myself using that. So it must be good. I can picture myself running with that, with, you know, with the iPod. I can picture myself wearing those clothes. Um, and this is because what we do as consumers is we base a lot of our decision making on anticipated emotions. How are we going to feel afterwards? And we try to get a sense of that before. So we don't just think about whether the product is any good or not. What we think about is how am I going to feel after I have bought that product? Okay, am I going to regret something? Am I going to feel happy with it? Is it going to make me feel sad in some way? Am I going to feel like I've missed out? Is it going to increase my sense of self? And we use this um, information in the future to guide what we do now. And this is why, again, looking at the marketing techniques and the things that retailers are doing, it's all based on these psychological biases. We can see in shops, um, some uh, department stores have started trialing smart mirrors. And I don't know if any of you have seen these or you know what they are. But smart mirrors, so if you look on the left of the slide at the bottom, this is where it's just um, a screen, but you can plug in the product that you want and you stand there and it does, uh, you know, it, it, might, it shows you an image if, if you were to wear that product, okay, to help us simulate wear, wearing products. And also we see a rise of things like storytelling. OK, so um, Treacle Moon, one of a, you know, a good example of this. We start to see brands trying to tell stories about their products. OK, I mean, how could you not want to buy this, this shower gel that says this on the label? It doesn't just tell us what's in the product. We don't really care how much it lathers up, do we? We don't really care what's in it. What we care about is the story, right? Deep in the night when all dreams come true, there's a candy store laden with gloriously coloured jars, each filled with memories so beautiful you want them to stay forever. So it's trying to kind of make it so oh, if you buy this product, you're going to have a great time, a great experience. OK, and this is all because of these biases that we hold. So rational decision making, then, if we think about it, you know, if we were purely rational beings, we wouldn't fall into any of these traps. We wouldn't hold these biases. It's a fallacy. OK, we just don't do it. And it gets even worse. We become even less rational when things are combined with anxiety. So let's take a look now at anxiety. OK, what is it? What do we mean by anxiety? Well, first and foremost, it is a normal emotional response. OK, it makes us more alert and prepared. OK, so it is, you know, it's it can be and it's there. It's from an evolutionary perspective, a good thing. It can save our lives. OK, 
it's technically it's a form of negative arousal so when we are in a tense driven or high kind of physiologically aroused state combined with a negative mood or negative affect that's what anxiety is it's triggered by a perception okay a perception of being under threat okay and the likelihood of that threat and the impact we perceive that threat to have on us now this is the key difference then anxiety is very much about a perception okay it's the key word okay because the same threat can be perceived differently okay now how then and as you can imagine during this pandemic there have been many situations that have made us extremely anxious and for me i'm quite interested as a consumer psychologist how has that actually affected our decision making how has that made or even our what used to be pretty bad decision making anyway how has that made it even worse <laughs> okay um let's have a look okay so um just bear with me a second first of all um from a neuro um, psychological perspective anxiety affects our prefrontal cortex um, and this unfortunately is where decision making happens right um, anxiety also creates a bias towards threatening information okay so what that means is which doesn't really make any sense that when we're feeling anxious instead of biasing ourselves towards positive neutral information to try and resolve our anxiety what do we hone in on? We, we, we um, amplify the information which is about threat. Okay, that's where all of our attention goes. So it becomes much, it becomes like a snowballing effect and some of you may relate to this. Um, so we, we bias our thoughts to the, towards the threatening information, the perception of threat, and also we are much more likely to respond quickly to a perceived threat, okay? So we become much more responsive, alert, okay? Reduced cognitive functioning. Now for me, one of the most interesting things about the interplay between anxiety and the way that we think as consumers is that it actually limits our ability to use working memory and to multitask. So this is where you have sometimes felt as I did in my very first lockdown trip, I walked through the supermarket door and I stood there and not normally when I go into a supermarket, I am on a mission. I know exactly where I'm going. I've got it all planned. I'm, I know which, which areas I'm visiting first, but in a very anxious state, I was like a rabbit in the headlights. Okay. I remember walking through and feel, walking through those doors and just thinking, comp I felt completely unable to do the normal things I could do. I didn't know where to go first. I didn't know which products to look for. I didn't know what I should be like, you know, how I should be walking, what I should be wearing, should I, how much should I be sanitizing my hands? And I couldn't even think about the products that I needed, okay? So again, I'm sure that some of you can relate to this. And I can hear, um, it's really great that you're interacting and you're putting the comments in. Because I'm in full slideshow mode at the moment, I can't see all of them, um, but I will respond to them towards the end of the session if that's okay. So, um, so yes, yeah, so unfortunately, anxiety makes us, it, it shuts us down, okay? It inhibits our cognitive um, processes. Why? Because when we're in an anxious state, we go into a preservation mode and protection mode, okay? Um, our brain does anything it can to remove ambiguity, to preserve mental efforts. So this is where going full circle now, we become much more susceptible to those biases and those heuristics that I was talking to you about earlier. Okay, they affect us more. We are, they're more tempting for us to use. Okay, because we just want to alleviate as much mental pain as possible. Um, so, you know, we feel comforted if we can just follow some rules we just follow our you know usual brands familiarity then that helps us when we're in an anxious state okay um some interesting facts and figures that i will be uh, going through as i'll be talking about as you go through the session and um, what some of which are from price waterhouse coopers suggest that um relating to all of this self-preservation and familiarity 46% of us are going to be completely at home at Christmas, 70% shopping online, 
familiar shops and brands are going to are going to be more important to us okay this is not the year for experimenting this is not the year for trying to come up with creative gift ideas okay so we're becoming much more risk averse familiarity is everything shopping online okay simplifying things so anxiety now can be trait based okay so if some of us are just naturally more anxious than others right so within our own personality we can have neuroticism okay that's how anxiety is defined or more politely sometimes referred to as tense driven okay but on the old big five model neuroticism is how it's referred to so if we have you know if we score highly on the neuroticism trait we're anxious um, it's going to be stable within us we're always going to be higher on that trait than other people at that time okay um, so unfortunately some of us before the pandemic hits we were already going to be prone to feeling more anxiety than other people just because of who we are um, now interestingly some research that has um, come out is from Demea uh, obviously obviously 2020 you know it's all pandemic related uh, neuroticism and introversion are the two traits that have been linked to stockpiling okay um which for me i, I think is quite interesting okay that you know, you know there is something about our personalities that makes us more prone to go and, and, and buy for lots and lots of food up front okay um but also trait anxiety uh, sorry anxiety can also be states based okay situational so situational or environmental triggers okay and again we'll look at how coronavirus has created some of these triggers um situational anxiety then results from some specific situation so for you know hypothetically speaking shopping in a pandemic right um this is where we have it's a response to a specific threat including and there are two broad types of threats that happen in a situation the first type of threat is known as evaluative threats okay so this is where we can become anxious okay regardless of whether we're traits anxious or not an environment can make us anxious if we feel that we are being evaluated evaluative threat or is there a group of people evaluating me or my competence okay so in relation to coronavirus am i complying fully to the rules is my mask on properly um am i walking in the right direction do i look stupid in my mask okay all evaluative stereotype threats okay now this is a strange one but again some of you may relate to this i don't know am i at risk of conforming to a stereotypical view that people might hold they might look at me assume something about me and it can make me anxious feeling like i am living up to that stereotype now these two broad threats are what trigger a lot of anxious responses situationally um, so for example you know these are based on my own personal experiences i am known for oversharing sometimes in lectures i hope that's okay <laughs> um, visiting unfamiliar petrol pumps with contactless payment so for example i changed where i got my petrol from i should say diesel sorry um i changed where i went because i wanted it to be contactless so i didn't have to be going in into the shop and interacting um but you know petrol stations a bit unfamiliar sometimes and i used to get quite nervous about like am i getting close enough to the petrol pumps because if i don't right if i don't get close enough to that pump and i have to kind of overstretch or get out of the car and move it are people going to be looking at me and thinking look at that silly woman trying to drive a car into the petrol station so i felt a bit conscious of feeling like a typical woman driver that stereotype completely not true of course but it's a stereotype i felt conscious of i also felt quite self-conscious coming back to work um engaging with this online teaching as i'm doing right now you know um because obviously i was on maternity leave through through lockdown thinking if i can't get the technology to work people are going to think it's because i've got baby brain 
you know, oh, she's back from maternity leave, she couldn't possibly cope, you know. So these are the kind of things that I felt anxious about, okay, all due to the COVID um, pandemic. There is, of course, tech anxiety, and some people feel this more than others. Um, you know, people, you can see there, you know, who's more afraid of who, you know, the, the, the students or the computers. Um, technophobia, you know, people feeling scared of being, um, or scared of being incompetent using different technologies. And we have lots of things to worry about as well, dealing with technology. And again, all this matters because it's amplified during COVID. We've had to learn new ways of living, all based on technology that we've never really had to do before to the same extent. We have to worry about what am I giving to them, you know, the people listening in, the information. How long will this information last? My consumer details. Um, who sees it? How will it be used? What will it do to me? Divided tasks, is it going to make me divided? Is it going to make it difficult for me? Am I going to become more compulsive? Am I going to become addicted? Am I going to become impatient? You know, we worry about all these things. You know, divided tasks, that reminds me of um, a concept that we talk about sometimes of the, being digitally distracted. Okay, so feeling like something digital is distracting us and it, we're constantly in a, in a sense of, of distraction. And again, as you can imagine, all of these things have just become more pronounced during this pandemic. We've had more reliance on self-service technology, online shopping, online usage, and just less face-to-face -face assistance. Okay, so do you honestly feel as comfortable going up to a shop assistant as you did before, asking people things? Probably not. Okay, much more insular. We can, of course, have anxiety about COVID itself. And um, quite recently, again, I've put the year, um, but it is 2020. Sorry about that. Um, the coronavirus anxiety scale. This is interesting for me because it's been recognised that you can have a specific form of anxiety purely about contracting the virus. You know, there isn't a flu anxiety scale, to my knowledge. You know, there isn't... Um, uh, there aren't any other scales for any other uh, viruses or diseases. Okay, but coronavirus anxiety scale became a thing, something that's been validated. Five symptoms of being anxious about the virus itself. Dizziness, you know, so for example, if we're experiencing a lot, you know, severe dizziness, sleep disturbance, tonic immobility, now, that's got nothing to do with gin and tonics. What that means is it's when we become frozen. OK, we're freezing up and we just can't we just can't really move. Um, loss of appetite, nausea, abdominal distress. These are all things that have been shown to be quite common in people who are suffering with coronavirus related anxiety. It's, it's quite quite scary, really. But I have to say. The most useful and one of the most interesting, quite profound um, pieces of research that I came across um, in relation to looking at you know, coronavirus and anxiety is this piece of research by Millman and Friends 2020. And this is all about what, what causes us to have anxiety. What can we do about it? OK, now, interestingly, they took the approach that if we're feeling anxious during the pandemic, it largely starts with whether or not we see that anxiety um, or we see the pandemic as traumatic. OK, so there's this view that actually some of us um, may have just thought the pandemic is just one of those things. Right. But for other people, it was a complete trauma. OK, and by trauma, the definition of trauma is when we feel like our core beliefs about self-control, um, autonomy, freedom, all of those things, um, they're disrupted. So for some people, they felt that the pandemic was completely traumatic for them, a complete shock to the core. Also, some of us were more or less able than others to see a bigger picture, to make sense, to make meaning um, of the pandemic. OK, and our ability to make meaning of this or our lack of ability 
um, or sorry, our, um, the way in which we, we might assume the pandemic is affecting our sense of self, okay, what we are, or what we make of the world, that those things could link to our anxiety. So really, it's did we sh did we see the pandemic as a complete shock to our roots core? Did it make us challenge everything we thought about the world? Okay, are, are we able to have? Um, are we? I know. Are we able to have taken a bigger picture? Or you know, did it make us reevaluate our lives completely? Did, did we know who we are anymore? You know, and I think you know, there's some stories that came out in the news that relate to this, which you know, people might have looked at and just kind of laughed at and thought, oh, that's nothing. But for example, you know, people's sense of self being, you know, not being able to go to the hairdressers, not being able to um, engage in the normal beauty and personal care rituals and regimes and, and habits that they could do because they couldn't get the products they couldn't get the services those taking those things away that related to your appearance completely has that risk of affecting your sense of who you are now our ability then to cope with this trauma or to cope with this meaning this sense of self aspect led to our um the overall anxiety we might have felt as consumers but it gets even more interesting, okay, because they also looked at um, whether or not social isolation policies, like how do social is isolation policies, so for example, um, social distancing, um, sheltering, reducing or traveling, how do those social distancing policies and also non-social precautionary measures such as hand washing, wearing masks, how do those things um, do those things actually reduce our anxiety? Um, so actually, interestingly, the social isolation policies actually helped a lot of consumers to feel less anxious. Okay, so we, all, we often think that social isolation for some consumers may have made them feel more anxious, but actually social, social isolation um, actually helped people to feel like they could protect their core beliefs. It helped them to make meaning. It was a proactive way of regaining control, you know, taking action. However, interestingly, people that relied more or less exclusively on the hand washing, the, the mask wearing, that actually increased their anxiety. So it's quite interesting. These are two different things that we've been doing or we've been advised to do. And one of them can actually make us feel happier, conversely, and the other can actually make us feel worse. OK, so it's quite interesting that, you know, um, all of these things should make us feel better, right? Because we're reducing the risk. But it's when reducing that risk tips the balance between affecting our core beliefs and our, you know, our sense of freedom and all of those kinds of things, because when it tips the balance too much, OK, we are likely to reject these these things because we're trying to um, preserve ourselves, as we've said. And this is why some of the um, kind of scaremongering or fear appeal adverts for some people may have pushed them over the edge and thought, well, you know, that completely contradicts my sense of freedom. I'm not going to do that, you know, um, whereas the um, public adverts that made us feel kind of just like we're, that were kind of more um reasonable okay so for example uh stay at um stay at home so we can stay at work okay people responded much better to those messages because they weren't trying to ruin or damage people's internal core beliefs bit deep is that a bit deep for tuesday afternoon no it's not <laughs> Moving on though, okay, so um, another good paper, no pun intended, uh, I'll trade you diamonds for toilet paper. And this is literally the, uh, the title of the article. Um, it's, it's not often that I think academics get to write an article with, with such, a great, <laughs> such a great title. Um, but this paper just kind of talks about the idea that a bit like um, any kind of process, you know, there are different phases that consumers move through like touch points milestones and during the pandemic we've seen consumers move through three phases all because of this anxiety okay so first of all we go through a reacting phase we've been through this reacting phase 
hoarding products, okay, and rejecting these policies, rejecting mandates, trying to regain control, okay, you know, Ne- never never in my lifetime has the toilet roll shopping been so exciting okay but or hoarding lots of toilet rolls and thinking you're winning at life coping okay so feeling like we're yeah so that would be the next phase after we've gone through that reactance okay because people only bought they only stockpiled toilet paper once they didn't keep on doing it and that's not because they still had surplus they don't they got that reactance out of their system the next phase that the consumer enters into it's just this, how am I going to connect, okay? How am I actually going to cope with this? Looking for ways to socially connect, engaging in um, self-esteem, building tasks like DIY. Um, also paying attention to, well, how are brands coping? You know, what are they doing? So becoming much more kind of aware and, um, and, and monitoring of what, what's going on. So after we've reacted and after we've been through this coping phase, then we start to adapt and this is where we see kind of longer term changes so the adaptations that we have now become accustomed to so things like telemedicine so this is you know drugs medical appointments being done virtually okay or technology being used to make um, like thermal sensors so that we can walk into a shop and we we know that we're safe or at less risk of passing something on um, simpler distribution chains, you know, it doesn't, we, the idea of um, we don't necessarily need to go through lots of complicated um, distribution chains to get our products, let's just go straight to the wholesalers and buy something. Okay, so this is how we have adapted and this is how shops and retailers have adapted. So, moving towards the latter part then of the session. So, how does the future look for us? Well, I think that for me, uh, the pandemic, I mean, I've always been of the belief that emotionality is uh, critical for consumers in shopping and purchasing behaviour. Um, but I think the pandemic pandemic has highlighted the importance of this emotionality even more. Um, the importance of feeling happy, feeling safe, feeling compliant, feeling like everybody else is in, we're in this together. I think that has the importance of that i think has previously been overlooked i think we're much more consciously aware of that than we ever used to be clarity simplicity fun i think these are the things that we will be looking for as consumers going forward and we you know we're already starting to kind of see some of these things coming out but i think that the pandemic will accelerate some of these uh these trends in shopping, which I will go through with you now. So, um, you know, so, well, so, um, for example, so COVID has, you know, it's changed and this will probably be a future, an enduring change. It's changed our ability to do things like, uh, just about a second. Okay. So for example, um, improvising you know we're much more confident as consumers to to improvise we're much more um likely to embrace technology we're quite happy for when the stores are coming to coming home the store comes to us rather than us going to them work-life boundaries been balanced um have been merged and we've discovered like say this like with diy this idea of um, coping we've, we've discovered new talents um, so it has changed a lot of our, our behaviours, um, and I think these things will last in the future. But in terms of what our shops and retailers and how they're going to respond to some of these changes, um, first of all, that shops and retailers have to acknowledge that as consumers, we have changed in terms of we've become more. So we've got new segments of, of us have, have appeared through the pandemic. 53% of us have changed our values since the pandemic, okay? So not only are we much more aware of, you know, emotions and uh, other consumers, we're much more aware of them and who they are and what they're doing. We've changed our overall values. Five new segments have appeared um, as a result of this, um, of, this uh, of the pandemic. Affordability, so 30% of us are prioritising affordability over anything else. Health, 26% of, of, of new pandemic consumers are prioritising health. 
planet, and this includes sustainability, such as shopping locally. Um, 17% of us are putting the planet first. Society, we've become a bit more, stif um, I would say, civic minded. Okay, we've become much more kind of um, aware of our impact on other people. And experience, so this is like the head on it consumption, the emotionality. So we've had these new segments that the pandemic has created. And all of these things then, I think, are wrapped up in, um, in, in different things then that shops can do to tap into these segments. They can make things more uh, convenient for us. Okay, now it's known that already that if shops are, or if brands are convenient and available to their customers, um, they are acting at a premium. They can sell, they can charge a premium. So on the, the brand simplicity index, 64% um, of consumers will pay more if they can have a simpler experience. 61% of consumers are more likely to refer, okay, to give positive word of mouth, to recommend a brand because it's simple, okay? So now these, these are all things that we started to kind of get a sense of about consumers before you know the pandemic but i think that now these things are going to become even it's even more important so i think if we did that in that study in five years time i think those figures would be closer towards the 70s other things then that to do with convenience um you know um, to do with simplification we might see things like walkout shopping yeah, so walk out shopping, you literally go into a store, you take your products and you just leave. And the, the technology captures what you've taken. OK, absolutely no interaction with, with um, other people, but there's no stress either. It's all very calm. It's very relaxed. OK, we don't have to worry about all of the different um, headaches of, of transactions and queuing and those kinds of things. It's all very simple. I think we were likely to see a rise of what we'd say is a concept store. OK, so um, this is a concept store of Lockie Tan. So uh, this is the idea that stores will no longer be. It's almost like they will either be these very, very convenient, huge warehouses that you can just go to and get your things really quickly. Or if you want an experience, you want an experience, right? you want to walk around and really immerse yourself in the products um, you want to smell everything you want to see everything you want it to feel like a nice experience but i think this pandemic is polarizing then those two different aspects of shopping something completely hedonic or something completely functional that doesn't involve any um any mental effort at all really we might see um, other retailers adopting um, something called treasure hunting, um, again, related to this idea of hedonism, impulsivity, um, impulsive decisions where we have no overthinking, okay, because we've learned now that anxiety is just, you know, it's a pain. Uh, we don't want any of this in our shopping anymore. TK Maxx, known for um, their treasure hunting approach. The excitement of seeing a jumper, knowing that if you don't buy it there and then, you will lose that chance, okay? Um, this is all based on the scarcity principle, okay? Creating this sense of excitement. You know, you found that piece of treasure. Okay, how exciting is that? And I, I think we may well see more businesses taking this on, again, to build, on, build in some kind of experience um, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, con for the consumers. I think also we like a bit like um, I gave the example earlier of Tree Called Moon. I think we will see something called like more brand storytelling. OK, so, for example, I think we want to know, like um, in the um, in the article I talked about earlier, consumers are now much more aware of brands and how are they responding to the pandemic? What are they doing to keep their customers safe? You know, how how are they adapting? And I think we are going to want to see this idea of storytelling in brands more. So a good example of brand storytelling um, that I can think of, and certainly it worked for me, is Ella's Kitchen, okay, um, baby food uh, provider brand. And, you know, they promote this completely organic, homely, 
value they have these this story all about their brand's heritage where they came from so you know you don't feel that your food has just come from a factory you feel like it's come from somebody's kitchen that loves your children okay you know i set up ella's kitchen because i passionately believe that ella my daughter along with her generation should have the opportunity to eat better food and also to discover healthy food that can be fun tasty and cool Okay, so I think we're going to see much more of this storytelling in the brands as well, the heritage. Now, I want to um, bring the session to a close with something, you know, which is my own, completely unfounded, completely not validated through any research yet. But I do feel that during the, um, the pandemic and things that have maybe contributed to consumer anxiety, is what I'm going to call the dark side of consumer behavior during COVID. Now, I feel personally, now, historically, we, we knew that there were things like conspicuous consumption, where consumers um, would use products to try and self-elevate themselves, to try and make themselves look better, look richer, look more stylish, look organic, where they would use their products to demonstrate something. But during COVID, that hasn't been as much of a thing. But I do think there has been a lot of other conspicuous behavior. So people doing things for show to be seen. OK, I feel like there has been things like conspicuous compliance, people standing in shops, standing in supermarkets and cafes, deliberately hand sanitizing in front of you, deliberately scanning, deliberately um, doing things to show how compliant they can be. OK, now, you know, and I do feel some of that has been con for done for conspicuous reasons. I do believe as well that there has been something which I'm calling conspicuous comfort, where I think some consumers have gone out of their way to look so happy and relaxed, uh, which that in itself makes other people feel anxious. Um, again, I remember being in a coffee shop, feeling very anxious. I had my mask on. I was standing very safe distance and I was just kind of trying to shout to the to the barrister. Uh, I was trying to shout to him, can I have a coffee, please? He said, how many shots? I don't mind anything, you know, just one shot milk. That's fine to try and make it really quick and simple and distance. And I remember feeling really kind of nervous about even being in there. And then somebody comes into the same cafe. And they kind of, you know, walk straight past me, no distance, no mask, which is fine. I know, I know quite rightly some people are exempt. That's fine. But nothing to show exemption. And this consumer is kind of having a huge conversation all about how many shots they'd like in their latte. And do they have, do they have any hazelnut syrup? And then when these people had made their drink, she was complaining about the size of the coffee and it wasn't big enough. It wasn't what she ordered. And I was thinking, you know, Am I the only one that's, you know, aware of, of this pandemic? And if I felt that this particular consumer was being just being completely wanting to show that she's completely unaffected by what's going on. So I'm classing that as conspicuous comfort. I think the last aspect of conspicuous behaviour I think we've seen in the pandemic is conspicuous um, civility or being civil minded. People going completely out of their ways, completely, um, again, potentially, not always, but potentially for show to be completely civic minded and looking after everybody in their society. Okay. This is almost that kind of the, you know, is there such a thing as altruism? And I think, so I do think the dark side is some consumers have been using the pandemic to communicate other things about themselves, which is not unusual in consumer behavior. We know about these trends already in other things. So, um, that brings me, and I hope you feel that we have covered um, everything that you expected to cover in this session. I feel that um, I've tried to cover with you um, the links between rationality and anxiety and decision making, um, some of the consumer behaviour research that I have come across in relation to this, and my own take on this on the on the pandemic um, as a consumer psychologist. You know, what have I been aware of, and, and what's caught my attention? But I would like to say then at this point, thank you for everybody that has been that has registered and that has been listening. 
Um, and they've been interacting. Like I said, I haven't managed to see all of your comments just because of, I'm in full screen mode. I will take a few minutes to look at them. Um, I would love to hear any feedback you know, after this session or you know, um, any, hear any of your questions. Um, or sorry, answer any questions, sorry. Um, here's my email address if you want to you know, stay in touch or ask me anything. And I'd just like to say, you know, to wish you all a Merry Christmas and hopefully a mask free New Year. So, um, yeah, and on that note, I'll stop sharing my slides. Uh, thank you ever so much, Helen. Um, just fascinating lecturer. It's a lecture, sorry. And um, definitely kind of um, something that will. Um, have resonance, especially with our students, especially because there's a lot of business students that have tuned in today, which is lovely to see. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll just kind of do some of the housekeeping and it might just give um, the audience chance to have a think and maybe ask any any kind of questions. So um, just generally to the audience, we've hoped that you en you've enjoyed today's session. Um, if you would like any further information about um, University Centre Hells Owen or studying HE at Hells Owen College um, and the University of Worcester, you can contact the uh, Community Hub Assistant, that's Lottie Summers. Her email is lsummers at halesowin.ac.uk. Um, like I said, if you've got any questions, please put them in on, on the chat so we can, we can hopefully um, ask Helen before she goes. Um, you will also receive uh, an email, um, probably, um, later this week, early next week, which will ask um, for your feedback on today's session. And it'll also give you the opportunity to um, be added to our mailing list as well. Okay, so Helen, just waiting to see if any questions kind of come through at the moment. Yeah, that's okay. I'm just taking the time as well, just to look at some of the, the comments. Um, it's quite nice to see that some of the things I've talked about have resonated with, with some people um, listening in today. Um, feeling like you know self pride has been damaged, um, being watched because you know because of the stereotype of, of, of being a teenager, making you more aware. Um, and I think sometimes it can just be helpful to give names and to give um, validations to some of these ways that we feel, like how you've all been feeling. There is it's it, there's a reason for that. Okay, it's common in a lot of forms of anxiety. So I think I hope that's been helpful to you. Um, but yes, any, if there's any, any particular questions that you'd like to ask me before the session comes to a close, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to uh, answer any. Or if you want to email them after the session, that's absolutely fine as well. Yeah, well, uh, one of our lecturers, um, Rhiannon, obviously just sort of is thanking you for the, the talk. Uh, but it's especially useful for our business students because obviously they have a, they have a retail unit. Um, and obviously they need to look at how retailers and consumers adapt to external trends and changes. So. Um, well, obviously, what you've talked about is is kind of perfect for that. Um, we have got a question, actually. Um, so why do people keep buying clothes and makeup yeah, despite the lockdown and wearing of masks? OK, Francesca, yeah. OK, well, yeah. I think that is completely related to something I was talking about earlier, which is maintaining that sense of self. Um, that if you if you feel that the pandemic is stopping you from from being who you are, then you're more likely to um, to kind of fight against the different policies that we've been having to adhere to. Um, so I think that we're just looking for any ways that we can try and cling on to our our core values. You know, the idea of we don't want our core values to be threatened um, because if if they are, then that will make us even more anxious. So it's all just self preservation. You know, um, it's nothing. It's nothing to do with being. You know like you said, the things you've talked about, it's nothing to be with being shallow or anything else. It's because of, you're just maintaining that sense. Um, if I can just look at some of the other questions as well. So how do you think the pandemic has affected education? I don't know how much time we've got for that. I could talk a lot about that. Um, I don't know. And I think, to be honest with you, I think the proof is in the pudding, right? I think we have to, we, we have to take stock and we have to look at how, what's worked and what hasn't. And I feel very confident that I think all higher education providers, uh, you know, the colleges, the universities, everybody out there is doing a really good job in experimenting and, and trialing with different approaches, different techniques to try and engage with students and try and deliver education. 
Um, but you know, it's it's a huge adaptation. Um, but I think a lot of good has probably come from it. I think by using more by doing things more virtually remotely i think it allows us to maintain our inclusive you know inclusive values um giving people autonomy of how they want to learn so yeah i think i think ask, ask me again in six months time <laughs> or 12 months um another question so alex have you seen any many, many major changes in attitudes okay health and well-being has moved on yeah so for example i think um the ernst and young um consumer segments there is a i think it was 26 percent. there's a huge segment of consumers now which are completely driven by not just buying health products but the healthiness of the products that they are buying people are becoming yeah much more um interested in in health so that is a known that is a known fact and i think if you look also at pwc some of their facts and figures they will they will they will confirm that view for you so have a look at those um ernst and young and pwc um tom yeah agree with that what you've just said um rihanna you said a fortune on gym wear but <laughs> yeah. yeah i think uh I'm sure, I'm sure you can wear those leggings next year. Okay, don't, don't panic. There's, there's always, there'll, there'll be time for Lycra again, I'm sure. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, any other questions at all that I can um, answer before we go? Like I say, I'm happy to do anything um, by email as well. Um, there is actually uh, one question um that, that i've i've had kind of through um email and it's to do with the streaming of things like um theater performances and, and and whether or not you think those will kind of continue or there'll be a kind of a sort of, sort of a, like a hybrid between kind of people kind of physically going back to the theater but still having the option of kind of dialing in so to speak yeah i i i i don't know i think that what will happen is that there's no longer i think there's you're just going to see a lot more segmentation so there's no longer like the, the the different group of people will just emerge so for example there are some people that the streaming it's a bit like the education question some people will completely get behind and they will prefer a streamed approach and other people still want the the face-to-face -face experience so i think all we'll see is we'll just see a split of the consumer group um, and that, and we'll have to kind of run. There'll have to be two different approaches. But again, it's hard to know what the fallout is going to be, and um, it'll, it'll have to be monitored over the next couple of years. But I just think there's going to be much more segmentation happening. Um, I just wondered as well. Um, Hells Owen, um, the, the town has quite a strong um, bid so business. It's quite a strong sort of business improvement district team. I just wondered whether you, whether you've kind of picked up on any any kind of work that any kind of kind of bid communities have been doing around the country in terms of um, you know trying to kind of encourage consumers to come back post lockdown. Um, not. I guess I I can only really comment on things that I have I have seen personally as a consumer. I, I don't think I'm in a position to talk about um you know what's been done at a, in, a, in a regional level but i do think that you know um the the certain providers and i won't i won't name them but certainly in 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 worcester that i feel have adopted some strategies that have made it very safe for consumers to kind of to go back so for example i remember talking to um a member of staff in a in a local cafe and he was telling me that from day one their chief executive contacted all of the frontline workers and said look how do you think we should be delivering our products how do you think we should be doing things and the staff all kind of sent in their views and it's all completely staff led and i think that for me you know i think the more businesses have been able to actually listen to the voices of the people that are serving the coffees that are that are kind of dealing with the merchandise the better because they're the ones that know their customers and i think it's really the the shops and, and the cafes that have been getting on the best are the ones that have been that have made you feel you know they, they're they're glad you're there you know they're happy to see you they, they they take control they tell you where to sit they tell you what to do they tell you what the process is so again you can just relax um and i think but i think diff i think there's been a big divergence in how cafes and shops and, and businesses have been able to do that i think you've had, people have had to have a lot of confidence um to do that for their customers 
Yeah, I think I definitely agree. I think um, I, I think sort of myself and others, you definitely sort of notice a difference between some between, between some kind of retail outlets and others in terms of how much control they're taking um, for when you yeah. kind of enter the store. I think the more control they take, the kind of naturally kind of uh, sort of safer and confident you feel in them. Yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes it's and again, it's all about it's all about reducing anxiety when people are feeling anxious. They don't have the capacity to make up their own rules or to decide what they want to do. They don't want to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. OK, so we haven't had um, any other questions um, uh, again. So it really is just to say um, thanks ever so much, um, Helen, again for the for the lecture. Um, just to the, the the audience, our next lecture uh, is on Tuesday, the 26th of January, and uh, it's going to be discussing creativity and well-being in the curriculum. So if you are interested, you can book tickets now. So if you go to the Hells End College website and uh, you click on facilities and then the University Centre Hells End. OK. Um, other than that, um, once again, just um, Thanks ever so much, Helen. And I, I can see lots of uh, lots of the audience thanking you as well. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. OK, thanks again to the audience and just to wish um, everybody um, a, a very a safe and a, and a happy Christmas. Thank you. Okay.